Hello guys. I hope all of you are doing great and staying safe. I welcome all of you to a very interesting and final webinar of our short course on well intervention with engineer Ahmed Al Zaftawi. I am Hassan Alim from Pakistan and I am currently enrolled in China University of Petroleum as a master student in petroleum geosciences. Guys, our guest and speaker engineer Ahmed Al Zaftawi is here who is a very skillful and dedicated person having 34 year of experience in the petroleum industry with an expertise in coil tubing nitrogen services wireline well testing well intervention completion and downhole covering the middle east engineer ahmed got his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from cairo university in 1983 engineer ahmed experienced more than 17 countries in his expertise as an instructor supervisor consultant and manager we warmly welcome you engineer ahmed al zaftawi for sparing your valuable time for educating us we are glad to have you guys if you have any questions write down in the q and a section ask anything related to the topic and please don't use the chat box for your questions without any further delay i request engineer ahmed al zaftawi to begin the lecture Engineer Ahmed Al Zaftawi, the session is over to you. Okay, thank you, Adam. Wish you a good day. Hi, everyone. Today is our uh, uh, last session in this group of uh, sessions we had in uh, short introduction to well intervention. Uh, today we'll talk about the wireline. Wireline is a big name, actually. If we need to talk about it, we, we might spend months together to talk about it, but uh, we will talk about it in almost an hour. So we will just go through the general idea of what's Wireline and how we use it. And uh, uh, we always concentrate on this session on the pressure control, how we control the pressure when dealing with such a device, which is the Wireline. So today we will pass through. We will not go to, into details of any of these topics you see in front of you. Categories, uh, we have slick line, braided line, E-line. We we'll talk about the wireline equipment in general. Uh, and we will concentrate on the last issue, which is pressure control equipment. So the idea, this is one of wireline units here. Yeah, yeah. This is how the wireline units looks like. Uh, this is one of the designs. Uh, but the objective is to have general knowledge. Keep in mind. If we say wireline, it is a well intervention technique to convey tool and instruments downhole. It's like coal tubing, if you ask me. What's coal tubing? I tell you, it is an intervention technique to run continuous pipe in a life well. Coal tubing itself is not helpful. Meaning, if you run coal tubing deep in the well, what to do? Without tools, or without pump, or without nitrogen, Coal tubing is useless. The same wire line. It is just the transport media to transfer tools and instruments down the hole and get it back out of the hole in a life well. We have three main categories of a wire line. Because actually, wire line is the big name. Where below that will come Slick line, braided line, and E line. These are the three categories that comes under the big name wire line. First one is the slick line. What you see in my hand now is the slick line. This is the slick line, or we call it piano line, or solid line because it is solid, it's not hollow. You see, there is no hole inside. Though these is little, 108, 125 of an inch. This is the slick line. And then we have the braided line. 
what I have in my hand here is a braided line. Braided line, as you see, it is, it's a wire, but multi-strand, multi-strand wire. You see it? This is the braided line. And then we have the third category, which is the E-line. E-line stands for electric line. It is a multi-strand wire. What, what's in my hand now is an E-line. It's a multi-strand wire, but in the middle, there is electric cord. This electric cord in the middle, this is to transmit uh, pressure and temperature. You can read it on surface, real time. So these are the three categories of the big wire line. If we talk a little bit about slick line, we have different size. The average size we are used, which I highlighted in this uh, slide in red, which is 108 and 125 in, uh, of an inch. Normally, if we work with the slick line 108, and we have a problem and we need to, uh, we cut the wire, for example, and we need to fish, in so many countries around the world, what they do when they pull out of the hole, they use a thicker slick line. So instead of using one way, they use one to five for fishing. Fishing means that I have something I lost in the well, stuck in the well, and I need to grab it, get it out. As I said, in many places around the world, what they do is they go for a thicker wire. So normally they go for one to five. But in this course, we need to stick in our mind that when we say fishing with wire line, we mean braided line. So we don't fish with slick line, but we do fishing with braided line. For a very simple fact, actually, that the tensile strength of the braided line is much, much, much higher than the slick line. So we don't need to gamble by going for one, two, five, and go all the way down, latch on the fish, and we fail, or we break in one, two, five, then we go to one, four, zero, or one, six, zero. So from, from day one, we go to a bigger category that can grab the fish from the first time. So remember, when we say fishing, fishing means braided line, not slick line. Uh, we use the slick line and the, the normal operation of the slick line, where we run a gauge cutter impression block, uh, when we set a plug or retrieve downhole 60 valve to open SSD or to run a valve in the side pocket mandrel. Uh, this is the normal application of the slate line. But when we talk about a braided line, which is a multi-strand wire, having many sizes, a common size we use in the market is either 316 or uh, <clears throat> 7 over 32. Uh, we mainly use this in fishing operation and swap operation as well, swapping. Uh, so fishing is the main uh, reason why we use a uh, braided line. Uh, the picture you see in front of you now, because we have two types of how we manufacture a braided line, either conventional type, as you see, or diaphragm type. The only difference between this and that is the way we we put the layer. So uh, in the diaphragm type, we, uh, all, all the layer are in the same direction. But the conventional type, it's opposite. I mean, if, we, if one layer is clockwise direction, the other layer is anti-clockwise direction. It is the same, it's a different design. Each one has benefits, of course, yeah. not to talk about it today. But generally, I need to know that we have two types, mainly conventional or diaphragm. And uh, 
What was the question about this particular issue? A nice question came in one of these exams, in the IWCF exam. The question says, you are running now with uh, 316 inch braided line, conventional type. And then for some reason, you decided to pull out of the hole. You changed the wire to braided line also, but not conventional type, to diaphragm type 316, which is the same OD. The question says now, what do you need to change in the BOB? And then I gave you a selection. Uh, we have to change a RAM, we have to change a RAM guide, we have to change a RAM insert. What do you think? What do we have to change? Should I repeat the question? Sure. We are running with the wire line, braided line, 316 of an inch, and then we decided to pull out the hole, change the wire to another braided line, same OD, 316 of an inch, but diaphragm type instead of conventional previously. What items of the BOB we need to change? The options you have, RAM guide, RAM itself, the inserts. This is the RAM. This is the RAM guide to guide the RAM together, two of them too. Or we have to clean the inserts. If you remember from the last time, this is the insert where it goes here. So they have to, to seal around the wire. Actually, the answer is you don't have to change anything because the VOB closes and seal on a certain diameter. Since you have the same diameter, you don't have to change anything. The RAM, when it closed, it will never ask you, are you Mercedes-Benz or BMW or Ted Labidos or uh, Max Factor? She doesn't care. <laughs> she seals and deal generally with OD. So you don't have to change anything, of course. The last category is the E-line, which is the electric line, which is multi-strand wire with electric cord in the middle. We have different sizes, but we use this in what we call here SRO operation. SRO stands for service read out. Service read out operation. So when we are downhole, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, whatever. We can read the pressure and temperatures instantly through a monitor screen at the surface. We use it in perforations also in Parker setting. This is how we set the Parker. If you, if you remember, if you still remember my words when we talk about the Parker, that one tile of the Parker, which is the permanent one, we can set it electrically with E-line. This is the purpose of why we use the E-line. And by the way, what I have here in front of, of you guys now, what I have it in my hand now, I have two E-line, two electric line, same size, same manufacturer. You see the one in my left hand side is shiny in my right hand, sorry. <laughs> the one in my right hand is shiny, while the one in my left hand is not. These are used ones, yes. Why this is key, it's shaped like that, shiny. This one is H2S resistance. It can resist H2S. But to make this H2S resistance, you have to pay. I'm not talking about money now, no. 
you have to pay something. I mean, I might, I might have, I might be more experienced than you guys, but I pay for that. I pay my age, right? So I pay. It. So not necessarily what you pay is money. This wire to be H to S resistance. You know what he paid? He paid half his tensile strength. So this one, which is not H to S resistance, the tensile strength of this is double the tensile strength of the H to S resistance. So nothing in this life you take it for free, except this type of courses that I'm conducting and Dr. Ahmed al Garhi is, 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 is conducting. Yani. But normally you have to pay. <laughs> Wire line equipment generally, regardless if it's E-line, braided line, slick line, it consists of either surface equipment, then PCE, which stands for pressure control equipment, and the third one is the downhole tools, the subsurface equipment. Today, we will concentrate on number two, as we agreed, which is pressure control equipment. And surface equipment is mainly the unit itself and the power pack. Uh, where in pressure control equipment, it's so many things. We have a quick union, stuffing box, uh, grease injection head. GIH stands for grease injection head. Lubricator, uh, riser, LBOB, tree adapter, uh, tool trap, tool. Blah, 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 blah. And the downhole tools is the tool string and the tools itself, whatever you are, you need to run uh, uh, running tool, pulling tool, uh, take over tool, uh, uh, overshot steer, but so many. You know, at, at the time we are talking together now, someone on this, on this earth is inventing a downhole tool. So uh, forget about the, the, the 10 items I wrote in these slides. Uh, by now, they could be 20, but these are the majority of the downhole tools we are using. Uh, what we see now, this is a rig up of slick line. Where we have here, this is the Christmas tree, and then on top of the Christmas tree, we have a riser, then we have a BOB. Then we have riser, breakers, and then on top here we have what we call stuffing box. And this is our wire. Here we have weight indicator, which give us an indication on the weight of the wire and tools downhole that we are running. And this is the unit itself where it it contains the controls and it contains the drum that we spool the wire on. And then the last one here is the power pack, which feed us with the power. This is how we rig up normally the slick line. So if I ask you a question, when we rig up slick line operation in this case, where is our primary barrier? I believe you, you said it is the stuffing box. It is our primary barrier. Where is our secondary barrier? It is the BOB, blowout preventer. Here is our primary, here is our secondary. Where is our tertiary barrier? It is the Christmas tree. Which part of the Christmas tree? Because we have so many valves in the Christmas tree. It is here, it is the upper master valve, right? Can you read it? Upper master valve, hydraulic, wire cutting capability. Why the upper master valve? Because it has the wire line capability. So if I ask you a question, which part of the Christmas tree is the tertiary barrier, and uh, the data I gave you is lower master valve 
has the lower has the shearing capability, then your tertiary barrier will not be the upper muscle valve. It will be the lower muscle valve. Why? Because this is the valve that has the shearing capability. So a tertiary barrier is not by 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 his name or by his position, but it is can he perform his job or not? If I put the suave valve is the valve that has the cutting capability, then your tertiary barrier will be the suave valve. Twisted normally in our previous session when we talk about the completion, normally the upper muster valve is the valve that has the shearing capability. So in this case, the tertiary barrier is upper muster valve because it has the shearing capability. This barrier I highlighted in, in green color. Below the Christmas tree, you will see it in yellow color. The downhole city valve. I didn't paint it green. Not because the paint galon is, is, is finished. No, because it is not a barrier. The downhole safety valve is not a barrier. It is an emergency barrier and we discussed the difference between the barrier and an emergency barrier. It is an emergency barrier, not a barrier. But here is a nice question for you guys. In downhole safety valve, we agreed before that it is not a barrier, it is an emergency barrier. My question to you is, could it be a barrier? Yes or no? Think for a second. To answer this question, I said, okay, what if during the operation in the life well, the primary barrier failed, the secondary barrier failed, the tertiary barrier failed? In our case, stuffing box failed. Failed means what? Failed, it means that it leaks and I cannot stop the leak. If the, if the stuffing box is leaking, this is not failed because I can increase the pressure to prevent the leak. But if you increase the pressure to the maximum and the stuffing box is still leaking, in this case, I can say it failed. So it failed. Then I apply the secondary barrier, which is the BUB, failed. Then I went to the tertiary barrier, which is the upper master valve, to cut the wire and seal the well, but failed. Failed means it didn't cut, or it cut but couldn't seal. So the third barrier, the tertiary barrier, failed. What should I do now? Do I allow the blowout to happen? No. I will go for the emergency barrier, which is the downhole city valve, where I will bleed the pressure from the surface, so the flopper of the downhole city valve will shut off, preventing the escape of pressure from the well to the surface. Great, the well now is secured. Would you please answer this question for me? In this particular picture, the snapshot I have now, where the downhole city valve is the device that prevents the scape of hydrocarbon to the surface. Where is your primary barrier? It is the downhole city valve. In this particular situation, it became primary barrier. And it will stay primary barrier. Till you fix your barrier. The moment you fix your stuffing box and blah, blah, and the BOB and the kidna, you open it for full production, then your primary barrier became again stuffing box. So the barriers actually, they work like a team. So uh, if we are running in a well, while running in the well, our primary barrier is the stuffing box. If the stuffing box fails, then we stop the operation close the BUD hydraulically and manually. Now, 
Where is your primary barrier? It is the BOB. And the BOB will work as a primary barrier till you fix your stuffing box. When you reinstate your, your work and start running the hole using a protection of the stuffing box, the BOB goes back to his original position to work as a secondary barrier. And then the stuffing box became again the primary barrier. They work as a team, and I believe the majority of you guys knows about football, which the American call it soccer, yeah, but uh, football. The football game is the same. You see the, uh, <clears throat> the one half defender is uh, injured, and then he goes back. You will see some, some other player will play in his position, temporary. Then he goes back, then... So it is the same thing. And barrier plays as a team. Now, we agree that this is our wire that goes through this weight indicator. And then here is the drum that has the wire. This angle, you see it here, has to be 90 degree. Has to be 90 degree. Let us have a closer picture of this angle. This is the angle I'm talking about, which has to be 90 degrees. If it is 90 degrees, this weight indicator will give you a correct weight to what you have in the hole. If this degree is not 90, you will not get a correct weight reading. And of course, in many jobs, the situation you have in the field or in this particular well will not allow you to make this degree 90. We understand that. That's why we have a correction factor. Because actually, if the degree is 90, you will get the correct weight. Look now, if the angle is more than 90, you will get less weight and vice versa. If the angle is less than 90, you will get more weight than the actual. And to avoid that, these mistakes, we have a correction factor that tell you that if the angle is one is 110, for example, you multiply by this factor. If the angle is 79, you multiply it by this factor to get the correct weight indicator reading on the weight you have. This is how it looks like the wireline unit. We have different shape. What I care about actually is uh, the pressure control equipment, and this is the beginning of the, our pressure control equipment, which is the quick union. This is most of the time. This is the first item you put on top of the Christmas tree to connect you to your tool. This thread is normally, uh, we call it acne thread. Uh, in a thread, when we, we, we need to specify this, this thread in my hand, for example, uh, this is MPT thread, national pipe thread. Uh, this is quarter inch. So I, I, we recognize it by that. But here the thread that is, uh, what you see is five three quarter, five three quarter dash four. What dash four means? This four means this type of thread, it has four threads per inch. Each one inch containing four threads. This thread is, uh, is an easy thread you can connect and disconnect easy. The thread itself does not make the seal. That's why you don't use wrench to touch it. What makes the seal is an O-ring, which is the black point. You see it here. This is the O-ring. And this is how it looks like. This is how the O-ring looks like. Uh, 
this is what makes the seal. That's why this one is very important because this is what preventing the pressure from escaping to the surface. Otherwise, the connection will leak and you'll have a blowout. The one I have in my hand, it is shiny. It has no cuts, no wears, no tears. Rubber, flexible. But I can guarantee you, if you take this and use it in your rig up, this one will leak. Even, this is a used one, yes, it's a used one. Even if I have a brand new one, this is a brand new one, and it's back, never been used. If I take it out and use it, it will leak. Why? This is supposed to be one time use. Because this one is exposed to uh, hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbon attack rubber. So it will not seal. That's why this is after each job you have to kiss it and say goodbye. And in the field, before, after I kiss it and say goodbye, before I say goodbye, I cut it. So no one can take it from the garbage and reuse it again. This saves your life. Please. This saves your life. This couple of dollars saves your life. One time use. Explosive decomposition. What is that? It's a phenomenon. It happens to all rubbers that exposed to hydrocarbons when you work in a well, especially with high free gas. This gas, whatever, H2O, is CO2. The rubber absorb it. The rubber absorbed the gas, absorbed the gas till the full saturation. But then the gas which is inside the rubber, which is your seals, whatever this rubber is in the lubricator, risers, or lubricator, sorry, or your BOB or stuffing box. This gas inside now, if you heat it due to normal temperature change during the day, In the past, when I was a young operator, we finished our job, and then uh, we rig down. So we release the pressure from the circuits, and then disconnect our hoses. We are ready to go home. Then the following day, before we go home, plan has been changed. We need to rig up again. So when we rig up again, we have to connect our regular hoses, male and female. In that age, when I tried to connect the male and female, I couldn't. There is pressure inside the hose preventing a quick coupling from connecting together. And uh, I keep asking myself, from where this pressure came? It is me, by my, this, by my hand, I released the pressure and it was zero last night. But then when I got knowledge, I discovered that you release the pressure from these hoses last night, yes, to zero. But what's inside the hydraulic hose is <clears throat> hydraulic oil. Now that we are at noon, noon time, where temperature is different, and I got the knowledge, if I have hydraulic hose, quarter inch size, hydraulic oil inside, if I raise its temperature by one degree centigrade, this will raise the pressure inside the hose by 60 psi. So if there is a differential pressure between evening and noon time, 10 degrees centigrade, that means there is 600 psi in this particular hose. 
This is just a piece of information I would like you to know. But uh, back here, it is since we have a gas inside now, and temperature change, so this gas would like to expand. But where to? This is a confined space. So the gas to expand, it will create cracks, blisters in the rubber item you are using. And if this phenomenon happens, these cracks or, 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 or blisters happen, you have to change the whole rubbers, all the rubber components here, because they are all exposed to the same situation. If you change only one, after half an hour, the other one will be damaged. After half an hour, the other one will be damaged. So you have to redress the whole thing. And you have to replace all the rubber element. This is what we call explosive decomposition or explosive decompression. Uh, our primary barrier is the stuffing box, which is top here, the top one here. Stuffing box is used to provide seal around the wire going in and out. And we agreed that this is our primary barrier. We have, as you see from this slide here, we have two types of the stuffing box. We have hydraulic and we have manual stuffing box. The manual stuffing box should be in the museum now, not in my lecture. But since we, uh, we still have countries around this world still using it, so we'll talk about it, Yanni. The only difference between the manual stuffing box and the hydraulic stuffing box is how to apply pressure to the seal to squeeze on the water. The sealing part or the sealing area in the stuffing box is this one. And here it is this one, where we have the packing. These are the packing. What you see here is the packing. Uh, this is what seal around the wire to prevent the escape of hydrocarbons. And from running in the hole and pulling in the hole, there, is, there will be a friction between the wire and the rubber element, the packing or the gland then we'll start to have a gap between the OD of the wire, the ID of the packing. Start to leak. To prevent that leak, what we do, we use hydraulic system to apply pressure to squeeze back or to use manual with what we call here a gland nut on top here. Gland nut where you have to send your monkey to jump all the way up to the rig up and with a pipe wrench to squeeze to tighten this gland nut, so this gland nut will apply pressure to the rubber, to the packing, to seal again. What you see here is uh, four different types of packing. You notice, here it is. This is the second one, this is the third one, this is the fourth one. Each one is different, maybe in size, in, 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 in length or color. Why? Uh, I noticed in my years yeah, in the field that uh, people put new packing and they start the job and at the middle of the job, the packing is gone completely and he is in a disaster. And he wonder what makes the packing damage like that? although it was brand new. There are so many reasons, actually. One of the reasons that these packing you are using are expired. Because this O-ring, this O-ring, which is in the packing now, brand new, it has a lifetime, even if you didn't use it. Normally, the manufacturer tell you what we call shelf life. It tells you that the shelf life of this packing is three years. Based on this packing has been set for these three years in an air-conditioned stored room. 
If it's not air conditioned, don't ask me about this packing again. You should throw it out. So, either you are using an expired packing, or you are using a normal packing for H2S service operation. We have packing that you can run it normal. So that's why before I go for the job, I have to ask you, this job is uh, gas or oil, high temperature or low temperature, high pressure or low temperature or low pressure. Uh, sweet uh, gas or sour gas. Based on this, I will select which, which packing I'm using. So, whatever you are using, gland, not mechanical, or here we have, instead of the gland, not we have piston and cylinder, when you can apply pressure through uh, hydraulic pump, pump that we apply pressure, this pressure goes through hydraulic hose to the piston on top here, pushing to the cylinder, pushing the piston down, applying the same. So here, regardless you are using a manual stuffing box or hydraulic stuffing box, the pressure you apply to squeeze on the rubber, the pressure comes from above, pushing down to squeeze on the wire again. What you see here in black, this is what we call plunger. Why we use a plunger? Let us assume that you run the hole, you did your job, and now you are pulling out of the hole. But since you were not concentrating on this job, you were talking to your friend or chatting with your wife on the WhatsApp. So what you do is, you might close your tools and you didn't recognize that you are pulling out of the hole the wire only without the tools which is supposed to be at the end. You lost it somehow. Now, when you pull out of the hole, you have nothing to prevent this wire from coming all the way up and out of the stuffing box. So when this wire goes out of the stuffing box, stuffing box is useless. Stuffing box to prevent the escape of pressure from the well, you have to have a wire, and then this packing will seal on the wire, but this packing will not seal on itself. It will not. So if this wire goes out of the stuffing box, what comes after? Well pressure. So you will have a blue out. So to, re to prevent this from happening, we have this black device, which call it the plunger. This is the plunger. Here it is. It has a hole where normal position. This is the plunger. But the time, nothing while pulling out of the hole, nothing will stop this from going all the way out. This wire will come out of the hole and then come out of the stuffing box, causing blue out. But we agreed what comes after if this slick line is out, the well pressure. So the well pressure will push this plunger all the way up here to go to this profile to act as a blind, preventing the well. How it act as a blind, Ahmed? It has a hole here, right? It has a hole. Here is the hole, comes out. But yes, the upper part here is rubber. So what will happen is, when you a well pressure squeeze it on this groove, this rubber at the top will be squeezed, acting as a blind. That's why this plunger, we call it blowout plug, or we call it stuffing box BOB, blowout prevent. So plunger, stuffing box, uh, BOB or blowout plug, all we mean this device, plunger.
what we have below in plunger is what we call plunger retainer, because if we don't have a retainer, this plunger will fall down in the well. So this is to keep the plunger within the stuffing box. Uh, this stuffing box is perfect when we deal with solid line or piano line, because this packing will seal on smooth surface, push bore surface. But what about braided line, E line? Because actually, on the braided lines, there's a small strand wire. If you have rubber item and you squeeze the much pressure, as much pressure as you can, pressure will escape between the braids, braided line, because we have grooves here. Pressure will escape from it. So the stuffing box cannot be used if we are using braided line or if we are using E line. We have to have, we have to look for another source of sealing. That's why when we deal with braided line, E-line, we don't use a stuffing box. We have to use grease injection at GIH. This is how the grease injection head looks like. And the sealing part is here in the blue color inside. If we take this part out, what's inside, we will see it's a flow tube. It's a pipe. Then we have the braided line with the E-line inside. Now we need to make the seal. We need to make the seal to cover this white area which between the OD of the wire and the ID of the flow tube. How we make the seal since rubber will not work, then we use grease. This green color. This high viscous grease, we fill this gap, this annulus well, through this pumping system. So we have the pumping unit, which pump grease, that this grease goes to the grease inlet, which is the bottom, and then goes, it comes from the outlet, which is on top, so it goes back to the pump. So it is, it's a cycle working clockwise direction with a pressure higher than a well pressure, but minimum 1.2. So if the well pressure is 1,000, so we keep this circuit of pumping this grease at 1,200 psi preventing a well pressure escaping to the surface. If this is true, then I have to ask myself a question. Now the circuit pressure is 1200 and the well pressure is 1000. So normally, the pressure will go from the high side to the low side. So the grease pressure will go inside the well. So grease will go inside. It's a lower pressure. What prevents this from happening? And what prevents this grease from escaping out of the grease injection head? Out of the grease injection head, we have a system here on top where we have piston and cylinder. Uh, and we have a pump connected to that. And what you see here in black we have a wiper blade. This wiper blade, it acts exactly like a wiper blade in your car to clean the windows. So while pulling out of the hole with the braided line, because it's braided, it will be full of grease that you are using. So you have this wiper blade. So while pulling out of the hole, it removes this wiper blade react to remove this excess of oil, this, and it goes through this drain line to a separate container and then with fluid because it's contaminated already. Since there is a friction always between uh, metal and rubber, and metal wind, so it's not in contact. This wiper blade is not in contact again, so it does not clean the wire. 
So accordingly, we have to use this pack of pump to apply pressure to the top of the piston, so pushing the piston down. When you push the piston down, the element wiper will be in contact with the wire again, cleaning the wire. This sort of pressure you put on top was actually the piece of information I gave you that the gap between the ID of the flow tube, the OD of the wire is almost 0.05 of an inch. So the volume filling that part is minimal. That's according, even if you have a leak, what you get from a minimum, minimum volume assessment. So you will, uh, the leak will be negligible. But it is true, if you start the job with one drum full of grease, you will end up the job maybe half, half drum full, maybe three quarter, two third quarter, depending on operation time and experience of the operator. I mean, again, if we assume a well pressure 1,000, one operator will keep the circuit as at 1,200. One will put it at 1,500. The one who puts that 1,500 is more safe, right? No, no, what I'm saying is not correct because he make, he create a very high differential pressure between the well pressure and the circuit pressure. And then he will have more losses inside the well of grease and he might end up at the middle of the job with no grease in his tank. Uh, so keep remembering that. Here we apply grease inlet from below, and the grease outlet is from above. When we talk about a stuffing box, we agree that if you pull out of the hole and you forgot your tool string down, what will prevent the pull out is this plunger. This system does not exist in grease injection head. And that's why we have, instead, we put below grease injection head, we put what we call SCU, safety check union. Safety check union. What does safety check union do? We'll talk about it. But this is a bigger picture of the grease injection head. And all this drawing you see, by the way, it is not technical drawing rather than it is for illustrations only. What you see here, this is the grease injection head and we have here one, two, three flow tubes, not one. Is it one or two or three? This is depend on the, the job itself. Is it gas and oil, high pressure, which, which category you are in? Uh, you increase the number of flow tube when the pressure is increased, or the category increased. Uh, so, what you see here actually is two flow tube above the grease inlet, and one below the grease inlet. The one below we put in the, the flow tube we put below the inlet is for another purpose actually. This one has less clearance than all five an inch. So this will prevent, it will help in preventing the escape of oil inside the grease, in, inside the oil. That's why we always say that uh, we, are, we pump in grease from the top of the lower flow tube, the lowest flow tube. This is true, this is the lowest of the flow tube, and we pump in grease from the top of it. Um, you don't have to remember this stuff, but this is just to, to let you know that uh, um, if we are using, uh, if we, our category is from 5,000 to 7,500 PSI, if we deal with oil, then we'll put four fluid tubes. But for the same category, if we are dealing with gas, we put five fluid tubes. So always we'll have one more fluid tube if we deal with gas rather than 
within the same category. This is the safety check union which, which we put below the grease injection head in our record. It is bone and seat. As long as your wire is through here, this bone which is yellow, it is on the side. The moment you lost your tools and you are pulling out of the hole, the moment the wire comes out of the bone, the bone will be dropped to the middle. What comes after is the oil pressure the wheel pressure. So the wheel pressure will push this ball upward so the ball will sit in its seat here and act as a blind, preventing. So it's a safety device. In case you lost the tools, you are pulling out of the hole, the moment the wire is out of the safety check union, the ball will be dropped to the middle, the wheel pressure will push it, make it sit in its seat here act as a blind, bowl and seat. So on top, on our rig up, on top we have stuffing box. Below that normally we have two section lubricator, upper section, lower section. Uh, the reason for the lubricator in the rig up, regardless we are talking about cold tubing or we are talking about wireline, it is to accommodate the total length of the bottom hole assembly you are using. The reason for using a lubricator or a riser is to accommodate the total length of your bottom hole assembly. Regarding this is called tubing or wireline, it is the same. If you are in the field and the service company bring this lubricator, to the location, what I suggest to do is take this lubricator and hit the supervisor on, on the head. Even if he will die, I mean, even if, 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 if he's dead, this will be nice because we get rid of a bad guy in our society. I hope you don't do this in reality. Huh? Uh, this is an old type. Because all lubricator we are using now has to be integral. Integrals mean it is one piece. But this one is not one piece. If you look at this here, you will find that we have a top connection connecting to this, and we have this connecting to that, and we have a connection here. So we have three connections now. And that's why this black lines you see, this is an internal O-ring. We have one here, one here, and one here. This internal O-ring. Each connection you make is a possibility of leak. If you need to do a job, you have to minimize the number of connections. And that's why, if you still remember again in the session when we talk about the Christmas tree, we said we have what we call compact trees or solid block Christmas tree. This solid block Christmas tree it has no connections. All these valves are not connecting through uh, flanges and uh, stuff balls and nuts, and, no. Why? Less connection, so we have less possibilities of leaks. So we are upgrading our safety. So also you notice that I call this one lower lubricator while I call this upper lubricator. Can I vice versa? Can I put this as an upper lubricator? No, if I put this in our lubricator, I have a headache. Because every time I need to look at the gauge or open the valve, or I have to have a shopper. Scaffolds. So this has to, to be a lower lubricator for easy operations. I will skip this, so time is passing quickly. Go to for the secondary barrier. Our secondary barrier is the BOB. What you see here is what we call a single actuator BOB because it has one actuator only. 
And internally, what you see here actually, this is the handle where after we close the VOB hydraulically, we agreed that we have to close it manually. So when you close it manually, this is a mechanical device. So if you have a scape of hydraulic oil, scape of pressure, this ram will not go back. The handle will stop it. What you see here is the ram. This is the ram, which you saw it before. Here it is. This is the ram. And this is the ram insert. Put it in. So this is exactly what you see here in the picture. This is the ram where we have outer seal and we have this inner seal. This is the inner seal. It's too heavy. Ah, oh, believe me. This is how the ram looks like. And we agreed yeah, this is the inner seal and this is the outer seal. If you are using the slick line, one actuator is fine. Why? Because if this is the ram and this is the seal, and if you allow me that I'll drop it because it is heavy, I use only this is the internal seal, okay, the inner seal. So when I close the ram, if there is no wire in the well, if there's no slick line in the well, when I close, This will seal on the other side, preventing the well pressure coming. And if there is a slick line in the hole, since this edge is rubber, and since this diameter is little, the rubber of the inner seal will seal on the wire and make the seal. So, this actual BUB you see, one actuator, because this one single seal will act as a blind and as a seal, it will seal on itself or seal on the wire also. But this is not applicable to the braided line, because if I have a braided line for E line, since the diameter is big, it will not seal around it. And that's why when we have braided line, you will see here a groove. If you notice on the drawing here, on the inner seal, here in the middle, we have a profile. Like this one. But this one is for cold tubing, actually. But, the, but we have less profile to match within the audio of the wire. But still, even if this is the audio of the wire, and then we close this rubber will not see on braided line or e-line because oil will escape in between. So to use slick line, uh, to use braided line or e-line, we have to look for another BB. This BB will not work. We have to use what we call braided line. The braided line BB is two actuators. I'll skip this sweep hole again, sorry for that, but uh, time will not allow me to talk about everything here. Yeah, yeah. This is the braided line BUB. The braided line BUB is two actuators. If you look at the top one, here is, this is the top one. Can you see it here? The same like the drone you see in front of you. But look at the bottom one. You will see that it is this upper seal, you will see it downward. So we inverted upside down to have this shape, which you can see easily in this lower actuator. Why we invert it upside down? If a normal, if it is normal, it is to withstand pressure from below, right? If we invert it upside down, so it is to withstand pressure from above. But from where it comes, this pressure from above? Let us see. Now, 
During the operation of a braided line, your primary barrier failed. Accordingly, you have to stop the operation. This is number one. Number two is close your secondary barrier. Your secondary barrier, in this case, is the braided POB. Two actuators. Let us close them. If you close the upper one, it will not seal because we agreed that rubber will not seal on braided line. And then close the lower one, which is inverted. Still, doing that, you didn't stop the leak yet. So what you do after closing, hydraulically and manually, if possible, what we do, you see this hole? This is grease injection port in the middle. You inject grease because grease is what makes the seal. And this is how it looks like in a drawing. This is after closing the upper and lower ramp. This is how the profile of the seal will be. The upper one, this is the outer seal, and this is the inner seal. And on the other side, this is the outer seal, and this is the inner seal. So when you close them, it will take U shape like that, preventing, as originally designed for, preventing the scale of pressure or resisting the pressure from below. The lower one we inverted upside down. So it is to withstand the pressure from this direction in this case. From where the pressure comes from in this case, because we said that this is the grease pressure now, not the well pressure. The lower inverted ramp, we inverted to withstand the grease pressure, not the well pressure. So when you apply pressure from the grease part, which is in the middle, pressure will go upward here. This you shape will prevent it. And then it goes down, the inverted ram will, pre will prevent it. And as long as you are closing the BUB, you keep injecting grease, because the grease is what makes the seal, not the, the rubber that makes the seal. This is the configuration of a drink of, of braided line or E-line. Our primary barrier is grease injection head. Our secondary barrier is not a single actuator PUB, but it is a braided line PUB. The first actuator is braided normal, and second is braided inverted. And then we do recommend to have shear and seal also, blind and shear. So braided normal, braided inverted, then shear C. This is our secondary barrier. Our tertiary barrier is a separate shear C B B, which we put it on top of the Christmas tree. This will be our tertiary barrier. Remember, the upper one is normal, braided normal, then braided inverted, then shear C. And this is how a rig up looks like in, uh, in the braided line or E-line. Our primary barrier is not the stuffing box. It became grease injection head. Then our secondary barrier is not a single actuator BUB, but it is braided line BUB. Our tertiary barrier is not the Christmas tree like it's like line. It is a shear seal, POB. Because in the slit line, we can use the Christmas tree to cut. The Christmas tree had the cutting capability to cut slit line, but the Christmas tree does not have the cutting capability to cut braided line or cold tube. We still have the Christmas tree. It is not our tertiary barrier now. Uh, we can use it as a tertiary barrier, of course. And down the wall, we agreed it's not a barrier. It is emergency barrier. This is our shear seal UB, single actuator. It, it is to cut and seal at the same time. As we discussed in call tubing, it is the same principle. 
uh, we have together almost one hour, two minutes, and uh, I am done. I, I am done for the time which we allow to talk about it. But uh, as I said, in wireline, we can talk month continuously on, on wireline. Yeah. Uh, Hassan, uh, it is yours again. Uh, if you have any questions uh, that you need me to answer, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Engineer Ahmed, for the well informative presentation. Uh, yes, we have question. A student is asking, uh, does the space between the groove of the braided line and the wiper element allow pressure to escape? Hi, I believe he is asking about uh, this slide. Let us go back to the slide. I believe he is talking about this slide. This is the this is the gap or the annular space between the the OD of the wire and the ID of the flow tube, which is normally 0.05. If you didn't fill it with anything to prevent, of course, this 0.05, the pressure will escape from it. Actually, the, the biggest disaster in the whole world, on the industry of oil field, Yani, which Gulf of Mexico, uh, what happens is uh, when the driller notice there is escape of pressure to the surface, he closes the annual BUB. And when he closes the annual BUB, which is a rubber item, he closes on the pipe. The drill pipe, I said the pressure is very smart and very strong. So, the pressure used his force to actually make a groove on the OD of the pipe. This tiny groove he made, now this rubber will not be able to seal because rubber to seal has to seal on seal, polish, polish. Yeah, a very smooth area. If you have this groove, you cannot see, and the pressure start escaping from this little tiny groove. So 0.05, of course, it will. And uh, what if it is not 05? Because if it is old flow tube, then it will be warm. Then the gap will be more than 05. It may be 06 or 07. And if you didn't fill it correctly with this high pressure grease you put. Uh, it will see. Definitely it will be. Yes, we have to fill it with this grease. I'm done. Okay, okay uh, Engineer Ahmed. Uh, we have another question. Uh, why do we have two shear rams in braided line rig up? Uh, one above the Xmas tree and the other below the BOP. I'll go to the rig up. This is the rig up we have. And I assume that he said, Ahmed, on the secondary barrier, you have a shearing capability. And also, you have a shearing capability in a tertiary barrier, which is the shear CBOB. We discussed this when we discussed the cold tubing, which is the same principle. The tertiary barrier we have is to give you additional shearing capability. If the BUB didn't cut, then you have additional shearing capability in the shear seal BUB. And this shear seal BUB has to be controlled by a separate control panel. We said you can put it up to 200 feet away from the location. So you can, in case of emergency, and you cannot access the location if there is H2S or uh, working in, uh, in, in, in a forest and you find a line in front of you, then you can control the well from a remote area. That's why we have this, uh, and that's why in the high pressure categories, you have to have, when we talk about the call tubing, we said we have to have two strippers and two BBs, not one. I'm done. Um, thank you so much, Engineer Ahmed. I think uh, that's all questions for today.
uh, we thank you for such an amazing lectures throughout uh, no words can honestly help uh, commending your efforts and contribution in this learning platform uh, this course has certainly benefited students and professional in these days of tough times the efforts of organizing team and especially professor ahmed al garhi are worth appreciating for promoting such an outstanding petroleum education without any cost i am also thankful to all of those who attended this course and got something new to learn guys join our facebook group arab oil and gas academy to join the upcoming courses and also follow pio petro on youtube and linkedin engineer ahmed al jaftawi our dps gratitude is for you and we expect and desire to have more learning from you in the near future until then please take care stay safe and have a pleasant day Thank you, Hassan, and uh, thanks for Dr. Ahmed Al Garhi who uh, gave me this opportunity to to speak with you guys, and uh, hope you uh, get benefits of these little pieces of information I gave you. Thanks for your patience, and um, best of luck. Thank you, and goodbye.